The Grand Canyon is one of the world's most famous natural wonders, attracting millions of tourists every year. But what if we tell you that a man had just made a discovery there that would terrify the whole world? This isn't some conspiracy theory or tall tale, but a bone-chilling truth that will make your blood run cold. The man's discovery has shocked scientists and experts who now fear the worst for the Grand Canyon and the surrounding areas. So get ready for an earth-shattering revelation that will leave you questioning everything you thought you knew about this iconic landmark. The enormous Grand Canyon, located in northern Arizona, was designated a national monument by Theodore Roosevelt as the President of the United States on January 11, 1908. Even though there was evidence of Native American habitation in the region as early as the 13th century, Europeans did not make their first discovery of the canyon until 1540. This was when members of an expedition led by the Spanish explorer Francisco Vasquez de Coronado made the discovery. It was not until several centuries later that North American people began to investigate the canyon because of its isolated and difficult to reach position. In 1869, the geologist John Wesley Powell led a company of 10 men on the first hazardous trek down the rapids of the Colorado River and along the length of the 277-mile gorge in four rowboats. This expedition was a first of its kind. By the time the 19th century was coming to a close, the Grand Canyon was receiving tens of thousands of visitors annually. Theodore Roosevelt, the 26th and 27th President of the United States, was a native New Yorker who had a deep love for the western region of the country. After the assassination of President William McKinley in 1901, Roosevelt became the President of the United States and immediately made protecting the environment a primary focus of his administration. After creating the National Wildlife Refuge, to save the animals, fish, and birds of the country, Theodore Roosevelt focused his attention on the federal government's regulation of the country's public lands. Although an area could only be designated as a national park by an act of Congress, which meant that any private development on that land was prohibited, Roosevelt simplified the process by beginning a new presidential practice of granting a similar national monument designation to some of the West's greatest treasures. This reduced the amount of bureaucratic red tape that needed to be dealt with. This ability was utilized by Roosevelt in January 1908, when he designated more than 800,000 acres of the area surrounding the Grand Canyon as a national monument. He decreed that this great wonder of nature should be allowed to remain in its current state. There is no way to make it better, but what you can do is preserve it for your children, your children's children, and all of those who come after you as the one magnificent sight which every American should see. The Grand Canyon National Park Act was not signed into law by President Woodrow Wilson until 1919, making 1919 the official year that private development in the Grand Canyon was declared illegal by Congress. There are already more than 5 million annual visitors to the canyon. The canyon floor can be reached on foot, by mule, or by boat. Nevertheless, whitewater rafting, hiking, and jogging are among the most popular activities in the area. Many people decide to save their energy and simply take in the amazing view from the south rim of the canyon, which is around 7,000 feet above sea level. From this vantage point, visitors may marvel at a panorama that has remained practically unchanged for over 400 years. Could the Grand Canyon article from 1909 have been made up? Skeptical authors, professors, and the Smithsonian of today all say the same thing, that this is nothing but sensational yellow journalism. They claim it's a hoax from beginning to end, created to capitalize on the credulity and superstition of the general public by appealing to people's deepest spiritual needs. The essay seems unlikely at best, and like a dishonest attempt to make money by spreading tall tales at worst. There was never a follow-up article, and the piece's mysterious author did a disservice to both believers and skeptics. Over a century later, the Smithsonian still refuses to confirm the existence of Kincaid or Professor Jordan, or even acknowledge that the story ever happened. The narrative further claims that Kincaid was accompanied on his second visit to the site by a Smithsonian archaeologist by the name of S. A. Jordan. However, the Arizona Gazette appears to be the only publication to have run the piece. Neither Kincaid nor Jordan appears in any official records. The academic establishment, unsurprisingly, blindly follows the party line. 
Online, a chorus of alternative researchers insists that the whole thing is an elaborate hoax. According to them, there is a forbidden zone in Grand Canyon National Park, where it is strictly forbidden to go hiking, camping, or exploring. The odd place names in this supposedly restricted area are cited as more evidence that the area is being surreptitiously monitored by the federal government. The more radical alternative groups, on the other hand, see this as just the beginning of a much larger conspiracy, including underground reptilian overlords who control the governing elite. The skeptical view is well protected by thick walls of authority and plausibility, making it difficult for a single paper published over a century ago to penetrate its defenses. An objective researcher is right to doubt a newspaper and an unknown author, but it would be equally foolish to trust the official story given by a government agency that unquestionably does have a conflict of interest in manipulating the official story of human history. The United States government's promotion of native cultures during the early 20th century is a prime example of this. So, what's the truth, and whose statement should we take seriously? Objective thinking, letting go of preconceived preconceptions, and riding the winds of evidence while avoiding the rocks and sandbars of confirmation bias, the formal and informal fallacy, is the skeleton key to unlocking any riddle. The Grand Canyon's prohibited area and the rule of law. The writer of the 1909 news piece seems to have felt compelled to use these identities for spectacular purposes. But the following step in inquiry confirms the assertion that this same section of the park is forbidden to examine, so this reasonable explanation quickly becomes challenging. The official document detailing the closed areas and roads in Grand Canyon National Park is predictably long and tedious to read, but it does contain some pertinent language such as the following. The following geographical areas and or roads within Grand Canyon National Park are closed to public use or are restricted by specific activities and or specific times for specific activities. Hopi Fire Tower and Access Road, Maricopa Point Endangered Plant Area, Hopi Salt Mines extending from River Mile 62 to River Mile 62. Keep in mind that these so-called mines are not actually mines and may have never been mine at all. Rather, they are interesting for what they are, ancient man-made tunnels, reportedly constructed by the Hopi. No one is allowed to enter any cave or mine in the park at any time, ever, without a permit, which will never be issued. The text continues monotonously. Furthermore, anthropogenic features, e.g. mine works, that include a twilight zone and a zone of perpetual darkness will be managed as caves, as per the Federal Cave Resources Protection Act of 1988. The Backcountry Permits Office is where you can apply for and pick up the permits you need to comply with this provision. Airspace over the canyon and two other national parks, Yosemite and Haleakala, was restricted in 1987 by legislation purportedly meant to provide for substantial restoration of the natural quiet and experience of the park and protection of public health and safety from adverse effects associated with aircraft overflight. Restoring the park's tranquility and protecting visitors' health and safety? What possible negative consequences on public health and safety could an airplane's high altitude over the canyon have? And if noise is an actual problem, which is highly unlikely, why are they only concerned about it in three of the nation's 418 national parks? There are other connections between these three parks. All of these places share similarities, such as a history of volcanic activity, the presence of karst earth deposits, the presence of large, as yet undiscovered cave systems, and local legends that center on long-lost human civilizations, demigods or gods. It is estimated that as many as 50,000 people may have made a comfortable home in the caves. Current Arizona Indian tribes may be descended from cave dwellers, serfs, or slaves, according to one view. Many thousands of years before the Christian era, a highly developed civilization undoubtedly existed in this area. This idea fits nicely with Native American folklore depicting the Anasazi as ancient enemies, and there is undeniable proof that the Anasazi inhabited the area long before the current tribes and that dark thing were happening at these sites. Human remains were discovered, but no animal bones or skins were present. Finding human remains is not shocking in and of itself, but the circumstances under which they were uncovered are very foreboding. Big Cave, located in Canyon del Muerto, is only a short distance from Mummy Cave in the larger Canyon de Chelly, 
the Canyon of the Dead. A cyst with a slab lining was discovered to contain the bodies of 14 infants. Four other children's remains were found in the large basket under the newborns. Legacies and Liars In point of fact, Professor David Starr Jordan was closely linked with the Smithsonian Institution for a period of 30 years, beginning in the 1880s and lasting until 1910. During this time, he participated in ichthyological excursions on the Colorado River and within the Grand Canyon. According to early census records, Starr was not his given middle name, and he did not choose it to become his legal middle name until much later in life. This meant that it did not become official until after he had already reached adulthood. Jordan was a staunch supporter of eugenics and served as president of Stanford University while he held this position. In 1899, Jordan wrote an essay titled A Study of the Decay of Races Throughout the Survival of the Unfit, in which he illustrated his irrationality regarding race degeneration and implored the effectuation of tremendous efforts designed to maintain racial unity. This essay was the result of Jordan's primitive pseudoscience and xenophobic paranoia. In later years, Jordan was the country that oversaw a statewide sterilization program, which was unequivocally a violation of human rights and a crime against humanity. In 2003, the name of many buildings in California was dishonorably removed, and the legislature of California overwhelmingly expressed its profound regret over the state's past role in the eugenics movement. In view of everything that has happened, it should not come as a surprise that the Smithsonian Institution would have hired him in the past to skew the historical narrative or that they are now trying to distance themselves from him. That's all for the video today. We will be right back with more such videos. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.